Nice, nice to see a good crowd up here. It's, it always helps to be stuck on a boat to get a <laughs> good turnout for a panel. Um, my, my name is Jamie Springer. I'm a partner with HRNA Advisors, and uh, I've been asked to moderate this panel. Uh, we have a, a great panel with, uh, I, for me, uh, one new friend and and uh, and one, two, three, four, four old friends uh, and and colleagues and collaborators. Um, so uh, it's it's great to be here. Um, so our our topic is the 21st century uh, waterfront and and 21st century waterfront development. Um, and I, I I will admit that when we sort of all started talking, we realized that it's a pretty eclectic group that we've got up here. Um, and so what I wanted to do is is uh, uh, as a as a good consultant. Um, you know, one of my few uh, positive attributes is, uh, is sort of trying to put a frame around things uh, for people to talk around. So, so just uh, to just to spend a minute, I mean, I, you know, I think there's a great sort of set of topics here around how uh, the human occupation of uh, both the waterfront, but also even more broadly, communities um, that exist on the waterfront uh, in the broadest sense. Uh, have to modernize and uh, contend increasingly with issues of sustainability and resiliency. Um, and the issues of sustainability and resiliency are things that we've spent the whole day talking about. So I, I think we can sort of uh, incorporate them into this discussion. Um, and you know, I, I work at a firm that um, that actually, you know, sort of works on on both sides of that, where uh, we spend time uh, thinking about large-scale real estate projects, many of which are on the waterfront, uh, and then uh, have spent a lot of time uh, thinking about infrastructure, uh, hard and soft infrastructure investment improvements across the Sandy-impacted area, uh, since Sandy in particular. And you know, I have to say that it's it's really important to have that dialogue occur, and it's something that you don't actually see at these conferences that much. I mean. You tend to have developers on one side, largely uh, in many cases still talking about hardening and elevation uh, as responses, although there is a lot of innovation occurring, uh, versus, you know, on the other side, a lot of thinking about massive investments in hard and soft infrastructure. And I think having a dialogue about how human development uh, can be more sustainable and can be can contribute to resiliency uh, is really valuable for us. And that's what we've got bringing everybody together here. Um, and I just, just uh, you know, one more second on sort of framing, you know, why does this, why does it matter that we think about development? And to me, there are really, you know, sort of two logics uh, that help you evaluate how to make investments in sustainability and resiliency. One logic is the logic of project level financeability. Um, if I look at, you know, particularly these last couple of years, looking at resiliency issues, you look at certain places in our city or in other cities and you say, well, there's a place where the uh, damage that I can avoid or the incremental value that I can create is more than enough to finance taking some sort of effort. And you know examples of like you know sort of the, the big projects along the, the Manhattan waterfront that the city is implementing is a good example of that. There is so much value adjacent to it that it makes sense to preserve that value, and one hopes that you're able to use a project um, uh, along that edge uh, to help to finance that project. So you know in some cases development provides the support for financing uh, an effort in sustainability and resiliency, and, and we've got lots of examples of it that we're going to talk about. On the other hand, there are a lot of conditions, and we see this in our city, um, where uh, you don't have enough property value or other forms of asset value to support sustainability and resiliency investments. I know there was some uh, a lot of time spent on uh, Coney Island Creek uh, this morning. Coney Island Creek is a neighborhood um, uh, that you know got uh, deeply impacted by Sandy, uh, significant issues. There is not a lot of real estate value, nor is there a lot of potential real estate value in Coney Island, around Coney Island Creek at that edge of the peninsula uh, or on the mainland. And yet there, the city and other actors are making a decision, a public policy decision, that there are enough vulnerable populations, there, the assets there are important enough for public policy reasons that an investment needs to get made. So there we don't have development able to sustain or support these investments, but we do it anyway. Um, and the more we can find projects that are in that first bucket, that, that development financeable bucket, the more likely we are to be able to stretch dollars and uh, make the sustainability and resiliency investments that we want to make. And that brings us to our panel, because I think um, you know, e each of the people that we have here is working in some way on those issues. Can I create a private project 
um, or generate enough value within private assets to be able to finance some investment that creates public value. Uh, and I, I think that that's where I want to sort of frame this and have each of them talk about um, not just conventional ideas that we hear about all the time at these conferences that we all go to, but something really new and innovative that we haven't all heard before. Uh, so I, I do, I want to challenge each of them at the outset to really tell us something new about the challenges that we faced in, in t that we face in 21st century waterfront development. Um, and, uh, and, and also about some of the solutions that they've been part of developing. Uh, I'm going to introduce them quickly. You all have your books so you, you can read their detailed bios. Um, we're going to start big uh, with James Servino, um, uh, who's a PhD and a visiting scientist at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, uh, also an adjunct at the Columbia Earth Institute, uh, and his focus is uh, on marine pollution, climate change, and coastal habitat restoration. Uh, so he's going to speak very uh, broadly at the level of systems. Then we're going to go to some uh, project level thinking. Uh, Jay Valgora, I'm sure many of you know, a wonderful architect and urban designer uh, from Studio V was just pointing out to me, uh, uh, is it five projects on Halleck's Point um, that you're working on? Um, and uh, you know, is really part of the reimagination of the Brooklyn and Queens waterfront and also portions of the New Jersey waterfront and a lot of other uh, projects um, that I'm not mentioning. So he's going to talk about that large scale uh, of project development and how real estate projects can contribute to uh, infrastructure improvement. Uh, then Ellen uh, Nysis. Uh, who teaches landscape design at UPenn, uh, wonderful landscape designer and architect, uh, spent uh, many years as an associate partner uh, at, at James Corner Field Operations, and most recently um, was part of the design for Hunts Point Lifelines with the winning Rebuild by Design project. And uh, I saw El the other day we were at the One NYC launch because we had the chance to work on that. And it was only about halfway through that I realized Ellen was standing right behind the mayor. Um, uh, and, you know, in a way, sort of the city was celebrating that Hunts Point Lifelines project and, and all of its virtues. Um, uh, then we have, we'll go to Claire Newman, uh, who's the chief of staff at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, um, and can talk about really, you know, in real time, how industrial development and business activity is revitalizing the waterfront, what it has to contribute. And uh, Claire also has a, a history working on a lot of this stuff at Bloomberg uh, Philanthropies most recently, but prior to that uh, as a vice president at the New York City Economic Development Corporation. So another sort of project level um, uh, presentation. Uh, and then lastly, my friend Nick Verard, uh, who's a vice president at the Louis Berger Group. Uh, and uh, really leads their environmental planning and resiliency services and uh, has worked in, in you know, I think maybe almost every inch of the waterfront that we've been touring today, uh, all over lower Manhattan, uh, had a lot of involvement in Hoboken and other portions of New Jersey and, and also a number of sites um, in, in Brooklyn and Queens. Uh, and Neek will sort of bring up the rear and talk about some of the innovative methodologies and tools that there are available uh, to improve the uh, ecological system, the environment, and also contribute to sustainability and resiliency for our, those, those human assets of ours. Um, so uh, for the panelists, we're just going <coughs> to ask you for just, just a quick a five minute discussion and I'm going to time you and cut you off because uh, Q&A is most important. Uh, and please do think about saying something new and innovative uh, for everyone here today. Uh, we'll start. We'll start with James. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, just wanted to give a little update on what's happening globally. And yesterday, there was a report from NOAA that in the next 30 to 40 years, the Arctic ice shelf will be melted. Um, and some of these predictions might be a little bit too high, but the ice will melt, the sea level will rise. Whether there'll be any ice left or at all is still a sort of um, an understanding for the future scientists to figure out. I work at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. My focus is on addressing and teaching the public about this organism that the honeybee of the ocean, what everyone forgets about. This is the, the little vacuum cleaner that's sucking up all the carbon and putting it into its shell and burying it. Corals do it, oysters do it, all calcareous bodied organisms along the coastal zones suck that carbon up, keep the planet cool, and create a coastal buffer zone that protects against shoreline erosion. Temperature is increasing at an unprecedented rate. Their little tiny immune cells cannot take the temperature that is about to happen 
in the next 10 years. Let's not talk about 50 years, let's talk about 10 years. What I've seen in the last 40 years of my life, being in the water since the 70s, I've seen a global collapse of food chains. Coastal zone collapses in coral reefs, oyster reefs, whether it be up here or in Indonesia. So that's the global problem. Greenhouse gases are increasing. They only go here. They go in the soil and they go into um, rainforests. Well, we know what happened to rainforests and now we must address how we're gonna sustain and protect these little immune systems uh, so that they can still suck up the carbon that keeps us cool, that prevents the greenhouse effect from increasing. Planners need to understand that these oyster reefs, these marine vegetation habitats are also climactically slash temperature sensitive. So when we design these um, landscape architects in the ocean, we need to understand, can these critters that we're putting in plans sustain the global temperatures? That's the global problem. Then we have the local problem, which is nutrient enrichment and nutrient pollution coming from sewage. We're doing, New York City did a great job in the last 30 years by implementing better, more efficient sewage treatment plants. My hat's off to the New, uh, New York City DEP. However, the population is increasing. So what we built to control the nitrogen and phosphorus from our waste is not enough. So you're gonna see this fuzzy little hair growing on all the structures and all the concrete barriers that we put in. Fuzzy hair does not promote the growth of calcareous shellfish organisms that stabilize the coastal zone. The reason why you don't see marine plants and eelgrasses and spartina is because you have a rise in nitrogen and phosphorus coming from our sewage. The reason why plants are moving more upland is because you see the fuzzy hair all over the beach. If you see this lettuce-like hair and these oval-like uh, algal blooms, it's because the nutrients are high. So when we install and implement these species that are supposed to create greener infrastructures, we need to understand, wait a second, I'm about to put together a plan and I need to understand, look at the nitrogen and phosphorus and ammonium levels. Can these plants that I put in sustain the hair that's about to smother me? As well as smothering the oysters and the shellfish that embed into the shoreline that protect against erosion. So I know my time is up, but I also want to just talk to you a little bit about of what we can do. And we can address nutrient sewage pollution. We can build better infrastructure treatment plants that control the amount of urea and ammonium that causes the hair to grow, smother the sand, smother the stabilizing uh, shellfish beds that are out there in the ocean. So global warming, are we going to be able to do anything about it? I don't think so as long as we keep burning carbon and we don't have smart grids and install solar panels on all these buildings that you see. So, but we can do something locally, and that's address pollution and then build better designs to create more greener infrastructures that can be able to withstand what's about to happen in the next 20 to 30 years. Thank you very much. James, just because you, you actually finished a few seconds early. Okay. <laughs> Give us, give us an example of the, the, best, the best project you're aware of that has done, that has addressed the problem that you're, you're raising a, a red flag Driving on. on the BQE, I saw this right, um, right below a, a Brooklyn Bridge Park. I saw this massive berm and uh, granite riprap. Concrete's not going to do it. All these structures that you put in that you hope to attract marine life, they're going to be covered with hair and they'll erode. So berms, massive vegetation, massive planting, restabilized soils so that carbon can be sequestered in those soils and create a fertile base uh, and granite riprap, I, I, as well as addre addressing pollution and installing these massive uh, oyster reefs around uh, New York City as best we can. But we do gotta address, we, do, we must address the chemicals that are causing the hair to smother their little heads. Great, thank you. Uh, Jay, over to you. So uh, I was kind of fascinated by the, by the title of this panel, uh, you know, talking about having it all. Is it possible to have it all? And something we talk about a lot with MWA is, is how do you bring together um, maritime use? How do you bring together residential use? How do you bring together commercial use? And can that be done in a, in a long-term, viable, sustainable way? 
And one of the things that's been an honor for me and my firm is we've been working with MWA for the last year, or WA now, which I love the new name, uh, for the last year to really help write and test the wedge guidelines and to really think of ways, and it was interesting to me as we developed them, and Roland played a big role in this, it's always about you have to have maritime use, you have to have commercial use, you have to have uh, parks and nature preserves. So a lot of our projects, which we're doing all over the waterfront, my firm Studio V is, is lucky to, for some reason, be working on a whole bunch of different projects in the waterfront. And we focused and tried to learn from those things, working with people like MWA, working with elected officials in the city and working with communities, how to combine these different elements on the waterfront, because the waterfront is to touch on all of them. So just to give some quick examples, and it's been really fun for me because mm -hmm. the boat as we've gone around the waterfront has actually gone past all of our projects, or most of them, except some of the ones in the lower harbor. So for example, Hallett's Point, which we just passed, we're doing five different projects there, Hallett's Point, Astoria Cove, uh, the NYCHA infill, uh, West Cove, and Hell Gate. That's five different projects with five different developers which I always like to say, all of whom hate each other, and we're the only consultant working with all of them. But we're doing things like, from a maritime point of view, we're putting in one of those first water taxis that the city's doing. We're doing mixed-use residential development, but also creating jobs, like with a cooperative supermarket. And we're creating parks around an entire area that today is separated from the waterfront with chain link fences. But then, as those projects get implemented, three of them are approved now, and two of them are actually going through the process with the city, where we're talking to them right now, it was always our greatest hope that we could really create new models for sustainable communities on the waterfront. And now, for example, that the Durst organization has bought the Hallett's Point development, which we've done the approvals on, you know, they're going back to some of the ideas we talked about at the beginning, where these are sufficiently large that they can do things like create their own black water sewage treatment plant for the development because it's large enough they intend to put that on site and not further stress the existing infrastructure, but actually do their own black water treatment on site because the project is large enough. And they're going to do their own cogeneration plant so as to actually generate their own energy on the site as well as major uh, sustainable practices relative to stormwater treatment and so forth. So it's exciting for me that as these master plans turn into reality, not only can they feature new schools, new parks, new residences, which we desperately need residences, as well as affordable housing and market rate housing, we need both, but that they can actually create the infrastructure that'll transform neighborhoods. We're doing a couple other projects uh, like that too, which we're testing with the wedge guidelines. Waterfront Commons, very unusual project. And it's all happening in the boroughs. This is actually the hotbed of kind of trying out new ideas. is isn't happening in Manhattan so much. It's happening in the boroughs. In Staten Island, we're doing a project that's commercial. It's retail. Really, it's just a shopping mall on the waterfront. Why would that be cool? But we're doing a 10-acre freshwater restoration right next to the outer bridge. We're covering the entire building with green roofs because we're working closely with DEC. And we're using that for phytoremediation to capture storm water and actually feed it into the wetlands, which doesn't have sufficient hydrology, and maintain and sustain that. And then also turning that into an educational feature because it's also an early human habitation, a Lenape Indian site, and needs even to throw in the mix, there's a 19th century Dutch house there. And we're tying all that together to tell the history of the site, the story of the site, and it's, you know, with a series of innovative wood-clad buildings in what is essentially a commercial retail center. But all of those components are part of it. One of my best things uh, that I love about the Wedge Guidelines, it promotes public use. So we're, we're fighting to put a boathouse in there because it's one of the wedge points for criteria and support has rallied around it because people said, well, I think wedge supports that. And so it's an example where, you know, the guidelines are just being tested now, but where life is beginning to imitate art because people start to believe in it and that's how you actually affect change. Last two projects, just briefly, one I'll just touch on because it's not public at all yet, but it's on the Gravesend waterfront. Various people are here that are involved in the surrounding areas. There was a conference a panel this morning on Coney Island Creek and what was interesting to me is, you know, over at the bar, I met some of the people that are working on that, and I'm doing the site next to them, and we're going to get together and talk about how we could actually integrate the two efforts for that, because, you know, they're starting to make their project known in public, and we're starting to make ours known, and it becomes stronger when you link together habitats, when you combine different projects, when you find ways of creating synergy, because there's no barriers on the waterfront between one site and the next, and you've got to find ways to bridge them, even including maybe infrastructure improvements. The last project, I was hoping we might come up to it in time, uh, and we're getting close to it, but you know, I can't time how the boat goes, but on the Brooklyn waterfront, we're doing the Empire Stores. 
The Empire stores are, you know, stores as in storage buildings like, uh, you know, ship stores. These beautiful Civil War era structures on the Brooklyn Bridge Park, I think really define that 21st century approach to the waterfront. Brooklyn Bridge Park is an amazing 21st century park and we're transforming those buildings into new commercial uses. We're creating a local Brooklyn food market. We're creating a waterfront museum. We're creating tech startup spaces and we're creating a rooftop public park that ties together the park on the ground with a park in the sky overlooking the waterfront. And all of those things are being tied together with other sustainable features like recapturing all the storm water for the building and putting it in cisterns in order to water that park, uh, using the funds from that commercial development to pay for the park and its programming. And then finally, because those buildings can't be moved <coughs> out of harm way because they're landmark buildings, to take them and actually create a flood wall around them so that we can actually protect them in the event of the next Sandy. So that's what we're doing, and now I'll hand it back. Thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll see if we can time the questions so you, you, we might be passing Empire stores uh, when we come back to you. Uh, so, so next we'll go to Ellen uh, to talk about Hunts Point. Um, before I get to Hunts Point, I yeah. guess I, I, I think maybe what most people see as barriers uh, to having it all, um, most people who are doing this work, uh, is uncertainty. So most communities can't rely on delivery of big, big infrastructure projects that are going to protect them and uh, revitalize the ecology in the time frame in which they need them. No matter how good the analysis or the plans are, um, large scale solutions are really difficult for us to implement because of funding, because of uh, you know priorities, because of the reasonable desire of agency doers to keep things simple um, and because it's going to take a little while to change the regs. Um, I think what we most need is options for scales and time frames of action between the giant Army Corps multi-decades mega project and individual property owners doing it on their own. Um, government alone, I think everybody here knows, is not going to save us from rising seas. and nor will every man for himself um, produce good outcomes ecologically or economically or socially. So I agree with the last panel that you know the technical challenges are manageable. There's really smart people working on this. We, we kind of know how to do those things. But the human hurdles to resilience seem to be the biggest ones. And so in terms of what we need there, I think it's institutions and policies and practices for delivery and for maintenance of these kinds of projects that it's not just a design or an engineering project that we think about physical things being integrated with policy and practice, that we need a cultural sh shift that makes this super long-term investment possible, and that every level of government and foundations and everyone uh, here is talking about the fact that communities need to be uh, more in charge of uh, making decisions about, they have to be powerful agents in deciding what the projects are um, and how the different elements come together. And we need strategies to avert disinvestment and further stratification of our demographics as flood insurance rules change and as progressive uh, you know, storms come in because humans need as much diversity in our ecosystem as the rest of wildlife does. Um, I think MWA and the guidelines are really right to focus on focus us on site selection. Rebuild did the same thing. Um, so the idea that we we need to really wisely choose places where we can develop and demonstrate uh, new kinds of solutions, the innovative uh, things that address those human hurdles and uncertainty. And I think looking for the convergence of importance and vulnerability, but also capacity and opportunity is the key to doing that. Um, for our team in the rebuild competition, looking for places where private business and communities were really, really skilled and, and motivated to try to work with government um, to produce an optimistic project that's not just you know, protecting, but it's trying to think about all the ways that you can uh, use these investments to advance. And it has to, I think it has to be a complex enough resilience problem so that there is no silver bullet. 
um, in, the, in the site selection. What we wanted to do was pick a place that had already been doing a lot of community planning for years and years and years and see if you could generate uh, a, a response to the resilience challenge that grew out of those community plans. So we would, as a design team, give shape to those ideas, um, but we wouldn't generate those ideas from scratch. Um, you know, the, the, the problem we started with, with there was coastal adaptation, but then the community said job creation, environmental justice are huge. Um, I'm going to skip telling you why Hans Point is a, is a perfect place to act, um, because I think a lot of people here know that. But, um, you know, what we decided to do was build on the diversity of edge and energy conditions between the Bronx River, which is shallow, and the East River, open to the sound, high energy, deep water, lots of traffic. Um, and also the openness of re the DEC region director, Venetia Lannan, to propose a proactive research model called Levy Lab, where we would do materials research, rapidly prototype and test techniques, and develop a new regulatory framework for the working waterfront. And I think everybody here knows that the key to getting stuff done is uh, call it a pilot and say it's temporary, uh, and that you're, you're figuring it out, and then you can move forward more quickly. And that the Levy Lab takes many forms as it negotiates the conditions of this diverse site at Hunts Point. And rather than replacing the existing working waterfront, it, it puts a greenway and that opens up our vantage points <coughs> on all of the amazing things about the waterfront that we like. So we're not sanitizing the working waterfront with design. We're allowing people to see what's exciting about it. And finally, I think the, the idea of integrating livelihoods. So, uh, the guidelines talk about modes of construction and operation, not just materials and strategies. And Levy Lab incorporates local roles in research and monitoring and construction and management and recognizes that jobs are really the most important resilience infrastructure in a place like Hunts Point, which is the poorest congressional district in the country. And the idea is that if the value of the resilience investment is felt every single day in new jobs and community economics, economic assets and awareness of the waterfront, we're much more likely to sustain that super long-term commitment. And in collaboration with Hunts Point, where we have, you know, these, the, the leaders of the unions and the markets and the community organizations are bright people who are national leaders in environmental action and green jobs and in, you know, cultivating uh, the most successful oyster reefs in the, in the estuary, to think about you know, how do people participate in the construction of their own protection uh, without compromising engineering and procurement integrity? It's difficult, but it's not impossible. So I, I really think that this is one of the places where, and we could talk more in questions about methods for doing that, but, but finding a way that we're not just contracting with a giant company to build these things or the Army Corps and we, we wait on a list for 15 years and it's a turnkey operation, we walk away, but communities are, are building studying, maintaining, monitoring, and we're learning from that process to change the way we respond to the waterfront. Thank you. Um, I've timed this panel very badly because we've now <laughs> passed the Navy Yard. Yeah. Um, we've also passed uh, Empire Stores, and uh, everyone I'm sure is looking at Brooklyn, <laughs> Brooklyn Ridge Park since it's come up a few times already. But, but over to you, Clara, you know, to, to at the Navy Yard, which is an innovative place in, in many ways and, and also a source of innovation. So um, tell us how that relates to what we're talking about today. Yeah, thank you, Jamie. Um, and I was going to ask to go before Ellen because I was like, there it goes. Um, but for those of you who... Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Brooklyn Navy Yard is a 300-acre industrial park. It's nestled in between Williamsburg and Dumbo, two of New York's hottest real estate markets, which everyone does know. Um, for context, that's about two-thirds the size of Prospect Park, and we're 100% dedicated to preserving industrial in New York City. Um, our mission is, is to create industrial jobs, support the industrial sector and its businesses, and I think probably most importantly to connect the local communities, Brooklyn, New York, to the economic opportunity that's happening at the yard. Um, so no surprise that my angle on this panel is going to be talking about using the, word, the waterfront and our 300-acre asset uh, for maritime uses, for working waterfront, for industrial businesses. Um, kind of ironically and interestingly for us, you know, Industrial has been a use that has historically been on the waterfront, and you know that's no surprise. Uh, it's been located there because waterways were 
used to be our kind of main way of transportation of goods, not so much anymore. Um, and the reason this is ironic for us is actually a lot of the return to the waterfront that we've seen in the past decades and the interest in other kind of use groups of being located at the waterfront has actually made things much more challenging for industrial. And that's counter to, I think, you know, some of the context that Jamie gave us at the beginning. So for us, you know, the l rising land value along the waterfront it is, is, is hard because industrial can only sustain a certain level of rent. So in that context, we do fill, fall more into that group that Jamie began with, which is we've made a choice to invest there um, for the policy outcomes as opposed to the ability to make a direct return on revenue. Um, I think what's exciting for us is when you overcome those challenges and when you keep the rents re low as we have and when you make the policy decision to invest in the waterfront, you see great results. So, for example, between six, 1966 and 1996, um, New York City invested $3 million in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. During that time, we also reached a all-time low of 300 jobs there, down from 60,000 in the height of World War II. Between 1996 and today, the city and federal government have poured more than $250 million into the Brooklyn Navy Yard for infrastructure, for stabilizing the shoreline. And in that time, we're now at 7,000 jobs at the Navy Yard. We expect that to double again in the next five years, up to 14,000. And so that for us is an incredible return on the investment that we've seen there. We have over 300 businesses, all thriving, and we're 100% leased. Um, so that's all great for us. Um, turning now back to kind of the context of this panel, which is resiliency, the wedge guidelines, um, accessibility. You know, we really do believe that we can balance the industrial success we've had there with those other goals. Um, and so let me give you some examples of that. In terms of resiliency and sustainability, we're very, very proud to be a kind of model of what a sustainable industrial park looks like. Um, we spend a lot of time thinking about stormwater. We have bioswales at the yard. We have permeable pavers. And we've done what we can to kind of reduce the impermeable surface that just obviously dumps what we don't right, want right into the waterways. We've also thought a lot about utilizing our roof space, which I know a number of the panelists have spoken about. But we have um, a thriving urban farm. Um, we're in the process of working on a project to install a huge solar panel system onto some of our roofs. We have kind of the ideal roofs for this right there. Can handle incredible loads. They're on shorter buildings and there's huge footprints. So it's a, that's a great opportunity for us to accomplish some sustainability goals. Um, James mentioned it at the very beginning. We actually have an oyster farm at the yard in one of our barge basins. And despite being located right outside two CSOs, the oysters there have thrived. And I think we've tripled their population in the past two years. That's a project we did with the Harbor School, who's here today. Um, we have a number of other sustainability projects, but I don't want to, I know we're on a very tight timeline. <laughs> Uh, so I'll just spend one second on the development we undertake. We strive to be LEED certified. We um, honor our historic buildings on the site and reuse them. And we've done some exciting and more pushing the edge innovative stuff like geothermal systems. Um, and I'd kind of like to conclude by saying a word or two about our tenants, our industrial businesses. You know, for us, they're both an end goal, right? They're the means for accomplishing uh, it's, it's, it's one of the things we're trying to do at the yard is stabilize them. But they're also really a source of innovation in and of themselves. Um, and so, you know, for example, we have New York Sand and Stone and Lehigh Cement as tenants on the waterfront at the yard. Um, they're incredibly critical to New York's construct construction industry. And the fact that they're located on the water takes uh, innumerable truck miles off the roads every year. And so that's something that is intrinsically green. Um, we also have a cogeneration facility at the yard. Um, I don't think I need to get into that. This group clearly understands the importance of, of that type of work. And then I think most importantly for us, coming back to our mission, is that you know these tenants create jobs and they diversify New York's economy. And so for us, that really is what helps make the city more resilient economically. And it provides an incredibly important type of access to New Yorkers, which is access to economic opportunity. Thank you, Claire. Uh, over to you, Nick. Okay. Um, so uh, 
I'll try to hit on some of the themes that have been uh, that have been mentioned before, and I'd like to do that by taking sort of a wide arc across the region because we're really with a, dealing here with a uh, with a regional issue. And and since it is now no longer MWB but just WB, uh, WA, I understand I can go outside the metropolitan region a little bit too if that's okay. <laughs> so uh, I'll swing over to Suffolk County first. And uh, in Suffolk County, uh, yeah, we're working on a, on a project called, uh, which is a Suffolk Sewage Project. And I thought it was very interesting what James was talking about with regard to the uh, nitrate issue and the eutrophication of the, uh, of the coastal waters. Uh, in Suffolk County, uh, the state is funding a $380 million project to put sewers in. And uh, while that sounds like a very sort of pedestrian kind of exercise, it's actually absolutely critical because uh, the uh, coastal shorelines in Suffolk County have been have been degrading uh, and uh, one of the reasons is because of um, 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 eutrophication because of all the nitrates uh, and there are no sewers and there are only basically septic fields and the like so here we see an example of um, an intervention that is uh, regional in nature and is going to benefit the uh, you know the flood resilience of an entire uh, area uh, it also points to the notion of uh, 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 you know infrastructure uh, you know, we're always talking about green and gray infrastructure, but when we really look at it, uh, a large part of what happened during Hurricane Sandy and, and also what happened previously was really because of our underinvestment in infrastructure. And our underinvestment in infrastructure, whether it's stormwater or whether it's the grid, impacts our local communities, but also impacts our businesses and our economic vitality. Uh, and here's a link with the Suffolk Sewers Project. Uh, one of the reasons why certain parts uh, one of the reasons why, why certain parts of Suffolk County never truly developed to higher density or with mixed use uh, is because they don't have a sewer system. So putting the sewer system in place uh, basically provides both benefits uh, for the coastal restoration and for resiliency by uh, improving the wetlands and it also provides opportunities for uh, managed growth in areas and creates uh, jobs. Um, I swing in a little bit uh, more closely to uh, to New York, to the metro area. Um, the Mill River is a project uh, that is part of a rebuild by design project called Living with the Bay. Uh, there we have an interesting situation. Uh, there were original concepts proposed uh, in, the, uh, in the rebuild by design uh, project. Uh, that is now being looked at from a more localized perspective. And as it turns out, one of the concepts, which was a, uh, which was a sluice gate, can now be uh, actually developed by utilizing uh, a historic piece of infrastructure called the Hempstead Dam, which is, uh, which is a dam that's more of 100 years old, uh, but can be uh, rebuilt and restored basically and provide the same kind of flood protection that's been, that's been absent for that area for a, uh, for a very long time. Um, there we also have the opportunity to tie in localized uh, improvements uh, with existing resiliency investments like for the Bay Park Sewage Treatment Plant where we take localized measures to, um, to connect a coastal shoreline protection system while maintaining the water recreation mm -hmm. aspects of those communities which are an important economic driver. Uh, it's just simply not possible to build a wall and go sit behind it because you can't get your boat out anymore. Um, then uh, I'm jumping into New York City. Um, the New York City Economic Development Corporation uh, has embarked on a, on, a, uh, on a great project that has both sustainability, uh, a habitat component, and a resiliency component, which is the uh, Wetland Mitigation uh, Bank, the Marshes Project um, uh, on Staten Island, on the west shore uh, of Staten Island. That project area, which was, uh, which was uh, heavily impacted um, by Superstorm Sandy, uh, was proposed as a, a wetland mitigation bank to facilitate, um, uh, amongst other things, to streamline the permitting process for, uh, for coastal development, but also, more importantly, perhaps the uh, restoration of a degraded uh, wetland area and a habitat, and at the same time providing resiliency benefits. Finally, I'm jumping uh, over to uh, Hoboken, to the other side of the river. Uh, Hoboken, as you know, was, uh, was part of the uh, rebuild by design process and a design competition, but prior to that there was a, uh, a strategic green infrastructure plan that focused largely on the stormwater problems which, while not as intense perhaps as the, uh, uh, as the Superstorm Sandy impacts, happens on a very, very frequent, um, uh, on a very frequent schedule. And 
it creates all sorts of problems because it's a combined sewer overflow. Uh, so if they have stormwater issues, it's not just stormwater, it's actually sewage water. So it's a huge problem. Um, the process there was uh, to develop a strategic green infrastructure plan that utilizes the opportunities in different parts of the city looking at the, uh, looking at the substrate really. So there's a, there, there's a part of Hoboken that's basically the rock part uh, where you have different opportunities for green infrastructure where you really want to store it. Uh, there are other parts of Hoboken that are at a lower level uh, that, uh, that provide for opportunity for detention and for, uh, and for treatment as well through uh, natural means. The process there really is to utilize the underdeveloped portion of Hoboken in the northwestern part of Hoboken, encourage private development to incorporate through development incentives green infrastructure uh, in their development projects over time in an incremental fashion creating the building blocks for a resilient Hoboken. And in fact, the North Hudson Sewage Authority is now planning to roll out this concept to the other parts of their service area, which goes to the benefits of a, of a, of a pilot project. Uh, in closing, I would just want to say that, uh, you know, uh, kind of following up to what my previous speaker said was this notion of uh, when we have a disaster, when we have an impact, to, and I know this has been said before, but I just want to reiterate it, to not just build back, but really use it, what I would call as a, as a resiliency engine. As a resiliency engine to reset the paradigm and to create opportunities, whether it's for recreation, economic growth, or coastal restoration, or all three of them, and do that in a way where you're creating local building blocks that provide immediate benefits for the local community and fit into a regional program. Great. Thank you, Nick. Um, I, I think uh, let's just give a round of applause to the speakers here. Um, uh, you know, I, I think that it's it was a it was a great way to conclude because it's it speaks to you know what I think you all have demonstrated, which is that you're thinking in the context of the uses, the program, the populations um, that you're working with, and finding ways to serve those populations. Uh, and also generate other kinds of benefits, um, e you know, each of you in your own way. And I think it's been great to hear that. Um, so I think everybody knows how this works, but there are folks with index cards um, wandering around. If you have a question, please write it down and they'll send it up. Uh, I will say, you know, the, the, the more a question is able to be uh, answered or directed to all of the speakers or as many of the speakers as possible, the more likely I am to, to ask the question. Um, so although I do have you know, a question I'm gonna hand to Jay uh, after who can, who can answer it specifically. Um, uh, so please do send some questions up. And uh, you know, the first one you know, is, a good, is, a, is a very good, good um, uh, question, um, sort of fundamental, and let me read it and then I might expand it a little bit. Um, why does residential or non-water dependent development get built on the waterfront? Waterfront development should be restricted to water dependent uses. Discuss. Um, and uh, <laughs> I, I, I think that's great. I actually do, because you know, there's people here working in such a diversity of projects that combine a lot of different elements. I'd love to hear the answer from each of you, but let me just add to it slightly, which is that um, you know, I, think, I, I think most of you are likely to, um, to explain how um, development is supporting innovation. Um, but can maybe also, you know, it's been a very positive set of talks here. Um, uh, talk about, so, g give us some negatives. I mean, you know, tell, tell us something about a project that you worked on uh, or involved in or some way that you're, you're, something that's happening on the property that you're working on uh, where it, it was impossible to solve a problem of sustainability or resiliency, um, you know, by virtue of the type of project you were working on. And then, you know, please go ahead and expand and say, how, how what, what kind of innovation do we need to be able to address those problems? So we've got a lot of positives, but um, let's sort of hear, you know, both your defense of water, non-water dependent waterfront development, uh, and then how, you know, wh where you have seen failures uh, in the ability to generate new innovation in sustainability and resiliency. And any order you like, start with James. Um, yeah, but we just published a book, um, Innovative Methods for Marine Restoration. Uh, we have an oyster project where we're using solar energy trickle charge to grow oysters in College Point, Queens. And um, we have many graduate students from Columbia, Pace University, Woods Hole Geographic Institute, and we're 
We're doing immunological studies as well as habitat studies to see how low voltage uh, can stimulate the growth of their shell and boost the health of their immune system. We specifically planted these oysters in a PCB Superfund site to see if the non-charged oysters would survive compared to the, uh, the charged oysters. And we've, we've gotten some very interesting results. Some of the setbacks and um, the problems that we've had is, is due to localized pollution, like nutrient enrichment. We get, some, we get some serious significant growth, and then over time, they start to um, get smothered with macroalgae. Um, and, and I know that these, we were, we're doing this in Indonesia, and it's working very well, and in the Caribbean. Um, and we are doing it pretty good here in New York City. However, if we could just adjust the amount of ammonium that's in the water, we'd get, we'd stop this fuzzy hair smothering my reefs here in Queens. So that's one of the problems that I've mm -hmm. seen. Yeah, right. Ellen? Um, I, I think designing with risk is still really, really hard. So we just, we, we've had a bunch of competitions. We've talked about, we've talked about design, but it's still really hard for us to move from the stage of design is opening up new ideas to designed things implemented and engineer there's a there's a sort of stage where things move from idea generation allocation of money to okay now now the engineers take over and we we implement the projects the way we you know we normally do and we don't have enough money so let's cut all those extras and do it in the simplest way possible and that i mean that's the biggest barrier to having it all i would say so we don't have enough money to do this on the, the scale that we need to. That means there will be winners and losers in communities. And the way that we currently know to split that difference is to simplify the projects so much so that they're more monofunctional, so we can do more coastline, but then we get less of the benefits and the, the designed and hoped for promise. And will you solve that problem in Hunts Point, or were you waiting to see the exec budget get dropped today to see if there's more money in the capital plan? We're, 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 we're ever hopeful, you know that. Um, if there isn't in this budget, there, you know, there, there, are, other, there are other ways. I think there, that's a project where you, you think of, it, it's almost, it becomes a negotiation. The project is something that you get a coalition of people believing in and buying into and uh, eventually putting all the money that's necessary to to do something that does carry that spirit of something that's truly community based and and has is delivered in a new way is maintained in a new way i think we we want that so you know there have to be i think it's a great place because of the two to one benefit cost ratio to say that you could the avoided losses are so big there that there's enough of an engine behind a project that addresses a lot of other needs. So it's it's promising. I mean I could I could build on something Ellen said and contrast it a little bit. A lot of our projects we try so hard not to make them monocultural and all the reasons you say that it's true like like there's a reason the larger question was well why why are we doing residential? Why shouldn't we do waterfront development? And residential is driving the economy right now. And New York needs, you know, a million residential units in the next several decades to accommodate a changing population. And trying to restrain that leads to a situation like San Francisco, wonderful city, but where it's almost impossible to build housing. And because housing prices are so high, they've initiated a policy of being even more restrictive in order to try to solve that, which has in turn only led housing prices to increase. It's higher than New York. So there must be ways, but how can we make them not monocultural? And in a lot of our projects, and I don't know if this makes sense, uh, but we intentionally make the projects as complex as possible. I don't want to <laughs> sound funny, but we do that. And we mix different programs, and we almost force different uses together. So while residential might be driving waterfront development, we added a public park, and we added schools, and we added a cooperative supermarket that would generate jobs. And then we found commercial uses that would fit into it. And the more we did that, the more it built support, the, way, the more it created constituencies, it allowed us to reach broader audiences. Uh, we added the water taxis, so there is a, a maritime use. And then suddenly, that developed a life of its own, and it got funded, and it got on the map. So there have to be ways where if you can add greater complexity to projects and insist on it through the creative process, you can sometimes use that as a tool for building consensus and constituencies and even funding. And I think that that's a good lesson, and I think New York offers that if we're creative and thoughtful about how we do development. Well, 
Nick, um, Nick or Claire, anyone want to? I, I want to say one thing, and it, which is that um, you know I think, and uh, at the risk of you know, beating that horse, so to speak, is that I think we need to move towards greater regulatory flexibility. And with that, I mean that we tend to just add regulations and never never revise them because we always feel that if we if we add them, it's going to make things better. And I think that in some cases we need to. Uh, revisit how we regulate the waterfront, uh, you know, provide more opportunities, incentives, uh, and rewards to do, be able to do creative integration of different uh, land uses. I think the origin of the, uh, of the legislation and the regulatory environment has been one of sort of reactive, uh, kind of like a do no harm. Uh, I think we've seen with many of the proposals, many of the initiatives that have been going on uh, are very, very uh, proactive, and I would definitely encourage the use of more pilot projects that will become the proof and demonstrate that a creative integration of different land uses will ultimately result, uh, basically result in a, in, a, in, a, in a more optimum type of coastal defense and resilience system. I guess the one thing I would add, um, and folks have touched on a lot of this, but what's interesting about the question is what do you do in a situation where there is a truly finite resource, and in this case it's kind of the waterfront and in context you do have to make in, in some hard choices, right? And, and I'm not sure that we always know the answer to that. I think from the point of view of the Navy Yard, and obviously we have an interest in seeing industrial on the waterfront, I will say that there is something to um, what everyone's talking about here, which is mixed uses and even having residential nearby can actually add value to the kind of use that is dependent on the water. And for us, that means it's easier to attract businesses. It's easier for businesses to innovate. And a lot of what we see at the Navy Yard, why why our industrial uses are thriving is because they're near, near talent and they're near places that they want to live. And so when you can strike the right balance, you can actually have a bit of an enhancing effect as opposed to having just somebody lose. Um. Great. Um, Another question we have here is about public engagement. So um, I think uh, I think each of you is working in a place where public engagement is really critically important uh, and in, in has shaped a lot of the work that you've been doing. So um, uh, the, you know, the, the question was pretty focused on Hunt's point, but I'd like to generalize it a little bit more and just, to, you know, ha maybe we can start with Ellen on public engagement and Hunt's point, but in this work that you're doing uh, in the on the 21st century waterfront you know it's not just sustainability and resiliency we know that the voices of citizens uh, and residents and the, the you know engagement uh, is is much more critical in planning for projects uh, that are that are robust and serve their population so so what do you think are the keys to that and what are the innovations that you're aware of um, I, you know I think everyone's talking about engagement but it still often manifests as you know sh go listen take the ideas back design something bring it back and say is that what you had in mind okay we'll make a couple changes and we're good mm -hmm. and it the kind of things that we're talking about where you want to have it all you want to have this rich site-specific uh, layered set of values embedded in the physical project and all the practices that make it alive, that's a different kind of engagement. Um, I think that's, you know, that's a long-term relationship and treating a community people like they are also experts. And uh, you can start, you know, we didn't have very much time in the competition, so our starting point was to say, let's find a community that's already really good at this and has been doing it for years, and then we'll see how we can take everything that they've been talking about and connect it with an agenda at the at the water's edge. So they had been planning a greenway. They had been thinking about, they just hadn't been thinking about flood protection before Sandy. And so that was sort of, and, and resilience of power. And so starting to think about how you took the resilience agenda, which creates an opportunity for change and an opportunity for investment, and then work with the community members with a little bit of spirit and enthusiasm, I mean, we, uh, we ended up having an Iron Chef cooking competition as a way to bring uh, all the interests in Hunts Point that cared about food uh, together in a single room <laughs> because they, they had different schedules. They work at night or they work during the day. And everyone, people had not actually come together to talk before. And 
you know, that actually began the formation of the the coalition between the Teamsters and the markets and the community because it was the first time that they had a good time together. And I, I think it's a, you know, there has to be a little bit more of that spirit for it to feel like it's not checking the box. Yeah, I guess I'll say one of the things we really grapple with is accessibility, and this was something that came up on the previous panel, which was that uh, you know sometimes it's hard to allow public access on a working waterfront, so it's a slightly different version of engagement. You know, our kind of solution there has been to think about accessibility in terms of uh, porosity and allowing these kinds of peaks at the working waterfront. And so, you know, there are places in the Navy Yard where we've brought back the wall and we have allowed for special pockets where we are able to more directly engage with partners, with community residents, both through our employment center, um, through more innovative stuff such as design competitions, et cetera, um, but to create these safe spaces, literally and figuratively, where we can have more of a direct contact with you know, the non-working waterfront. Um, and we also have some incredible partnerships with you know, folks like the Harbor School, who I already mentioned, who are able to, again, in a safe way and in a limited way, come and they have space on our waterfront where they, you know, where the high school students learn about maritime construction and they learn about the maritime industry in a first-hand way. Um, and so that's something that we've been grappling with and looking for solutions to, which is increasing that access to the waterfront without compromising the fact that we do have businesses there who are, you know, literally moving modular housing units around on cranes or repairing huge ships that are the length of the Chrysler building. Um, and so kind of balancing those tensions. Public engagement on your projects, Jay? Um, well, we run into this all the time and I, I could give you two examples, like one that we're working on and one that's just starting. Um, you know, a great example for me is, is this one, I mentioned briefly, Waterfront Commons where how do we combine? We want to create a nature preserve. We want to create a 10-acre, uh, you know, uh, freshwater wetland restoration. And when we work with DEP, and, and they've been, you know, evolving in their point of view, and, and you know, actually really good partners to work with. But we also want to create a community boathouse. And on the one hand, there's a point of view like, well, we want to go down and touch the water because we have an inlet there, and it's perfect for human-powered boats, and the community would love it. And on the other hand, there's another body of thought that says, you know, we need to preserve this area, we don't want people to touch it. Mm -hmm. And so we oftentimes work in this contradiction between the two and find the right compromises. That's why actually in some ways the wedge guidelines, which actually address this because they promote biodiversity and, and restorative habitat, but they also promote public access. And I think sometimes you want to have it all and you want to combine them. If the project is large enough and rich enough, you can make a better project. And I think you have to address those things and letting people go to the water makes them understand it better. You do it in some limited areas, in the right areas, and in other areas, maybe you limit access, but you even get the benefit of telling that story and having people understand it and getting education, maybe about some of that uh, fuzzy hair and they can understand it better. And maybe it'll start to change habits. Um, we're doing another project, this one's interesting, where resiliency bumps up against public access. You know, we're working on the whole waterfront section of Inwood. You know, I like to call it our third river, the Harlem River that doesn't really get enough talk, and it's a very different scale river. And the MTA has a major rail yard there. The councilman spoke this morning, Councilman Rodriguez, because he wants, he has various plans for that, and we're working with the city and the EDC in the early stages of a project. But the MTA is building a wall around that rail yard because they have to protect it. It flooded during Sandy. But we see that as an essential public access point for a community to connect the northern and southern parts of the Harlem River waterfront. And so we're working very hard to engage between those parties and they have very different points of view and there's very serious technical issues and funding issues and we're going to work to try to find a way between them to make it resilient and provide public access. It's not easy, but I think those are the challenges of our time and I think we have to address them. Anything? Uh, yeah. you know, one thing I will say is uh, usually the best way to uh, link, uh, you know, the resiliency concept to implementation at a local level uh, is to build on something, and, and I think you've mentioned this too, perhaps uh, th that that or that's already alive in the community. You know, whether they want another baseball field or whether there's a there's a bike path that they've been trying to get for a long time, or there are other things there 
those are really the nuggets that you can use to tie those things into a resiliency plan because when all is said and done, uh, you know, you'll find that, in a, at least we found that in a lot of these communities, to implement the kind of resiliency that would actually protect them against a superstorm Sandy uh, at the local level is, is, is basically virtually impossible. Uh, you can do something about the you know, lower level of inundation and flooding and even the daily levels uh, of inundation and flooding, which actually are actually quite prevalent, but you can't do it for the really big items. Uh, the way to do it is to tie it to local benefits and, and really get support for uh, the regional implementation of larger plants. Yeah, at Bloomberg Philanthropies, we used to talk a lot about uh, proven and promising or proven or promising ideas, and I think one of the, both the obligations and opportunities that we have at the Navy Yard as kind of a pseudo public organization is to take a leap of faith on ideas that are just promising. Um, so an example of that is we have these uh, light posts on our public street, well, our internal streets and on our internal parking lots that are entirely off the grid. They're Lumi Solaires and they rely on both a solar technology and then a wind technology. And when we decided to do it, it was not even close to as cheap as just putting in a standard light post. But we did it because, you know, we felt like this was a place where we could lead the way. Um, and, you know, that has ups and downs, right? Uh, for us, in this case, on, the, on this um, essentially trial uh, that we took, you know, the first time around, the wind technology didn't work that well. So we have these Lumi, Lumi Solaires, they work well, but they, they're not the top of the line. But it was helpful for the folks who are actually doing this work to kind of use us as a guinea pig um, because now they've got it figured out and the cost on these lampposts has come way down, they work a lot better, and these folks are signing contracts with parks across the city with other parking lots. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of given this technology a leg up to be something that can work at a smaller scale and that can work um, for folks who have to be concerned with the bottom line. Um, so that's a role that we're able to fill, but that you know we wouldn't be able to if we were just a for-profit developer. And, and, and that's important to have that kind of spectrum. We, we took a similar approach in, um, in Hans Point, thinking initially about things like HESCO barriers and how uh, you could build modular systems with cast glass or cast concrete. Um, we started looking at things like the reef balls and jacks and uh, trying to understand why, what would stop us from creating a Levy Lab co-op. While the money is assembled to do something bigger, you know, we could have great designers and scientists come together. We could capitalize it with venture capital and maybe the foundations that think it's a really terrific idea to embed jobs in the design of this thing, start making them and testing them with the approval of a, uh, of a regulator who's really interested in it and work with private maritime businesses to put some panels in place, put some, you know, start studying it with universities. And so that's a way that we can start. And I think there, that, that once we start to focus on creating those other scales and time frames of action, we could generate a lot more examples. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I, um, unless there's any other burning question out there, or if any of you want to say anything to each other uh, or comment on anything that anyone else has said, um, I, I actually I, I, I want to thank you all. Um, this has been really interesting. It was indeed eclectic, um, <laughs> uh, but we but it means we covered a lot of territory, um, and in particular, I have to say that the the last sort of set of responses. Um, was really interesting and helpful because in many ways, you know, the innovation where we have a ton of value and play uh, and we have lots of uh, time and, and space to work um, is a little bit easier, but it's, it's carving out some of those innovations at the smaller scale that, uh, real, you know, can be more helpful in many ways for a, a lot of the places that uh, struggle to uh, keep, hold together development, res resiliency and sustainability at the waterfront. So this has been a great panel. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you.